At Blackthorn Salt, we have revived a centuries-old technique. Our location and sense of place is at the core of who we are. The west coast of Scotland is our backdrop, our history and our inspiration. It provides our only ingredient, pure seawater. We are using the forces of nature to create one of the oldest and most necessary ingredients of all, salt. No additives, just pure 100% Scottish seawater. It's a slow and simple process. We trickle the seawater through the blackthorn and allow the sun and wind to work their magic. This spiky blackthorn is key. It maximizes the seawater's exposure to the wind as it trickles down our tower, slowly and naturally concentrating the seawater. The concentrated salt water is moved indoors to the pan house at the precise moment. Under the careful supervision of our salters, blackthorn salt crystals are grown, each one unique. Thousands of these perfect geometric shapes are collected and dried. At the end of this patient process, we are rewarded with a salt that has its own unique and delicious flavour. It took years to perfect harnessing the wind and sea to ensure we created Blackthorn Salt. Um, I'm going to start a little bit uh, with a bit of the local history, um, which I think probably people know a lot more about it here than I do. But um, you can see where, where we are, uh, which is this sort of little flower there. Um, and you can see within that, there's, within a sort of stone throw of there, there are sort of six pans that used to be. So we, we are actually on a road called Salt Pans Road. Uh, which is, leads off to Wagon Road, and we also have salt fields as well around the corner. So there was there's a huge amount of evidence that there was uh, lots of um, salt production round about us. Especially these, which um, some of you may recognise as Maryborough Pan Houses, uh, which um, we were fortunate enough to go inside. Um, these uh, stopped working a long time ago, but actually, quite interestingly, we got a letter from uh, someone who used to go and stay with their Aunt Jeannie, who owned them. Uh, it was about 30 years or so after they'd shut that uh, they used to use them as a bo boat storage, and he used to live up, up in the top area, with, which was sort of split into two rooms. But as you can see, and this is the under, underneath, as it were, uh, where the pans were, and, and I'm pretty sure, and I think we've touched on it a bit before, is that um, the mortar in there, I think, would probably be the pan cratch, which is what they used to use, use it a lot for. You know, they would take it out and use it. In fact, we had someone come and take some of our pan cratch and, and use it or test it to see if they could use it as mortar again. But, of course, it was sort of used in medicine and alkaline again, but I, I think this was probably much easier for them. Just, uh, just down on the, on the coast, down from the tower, uh, we came across one of these in the low tide. I don't know if anyone can hazard a guess what it is. Yep. What is it? I'm, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, this is an old coal shaft. So, basically the coal mine shaft. So, it actually used to be, uh, I suppose, a chimney ultimately, a stack that went up quite high. And there are three of these in between us and the Maryborough Pan House, which is just along the road. So. And, and that's the Gordon Setter. If that was the more interesting part, I don't know. But I think my children might think that. So, so where does salt come from? Uh, and, and I think you probably all know the answer to this, but I'm just going to run, run through briefly. There are three main types of salt. So there's the rock salt. I've been fortunate enough to go down various mines and look in various places. This is uh, one in Germany uh, where they use explosives. This is another one actually in Winsford in Cheshire where they use a continuous miner. And um, in fact, this is, this is me on the right-hand side. I had a bit more hair. And uh, on the uh, east-west divide underground of, uh, in Germany. So, um, and uh, 
the other one is, and I don't know if any of you have a chance ever to go to Krakow, this is an amazing mine over there, which is, uh, this is all, all you can see is made out of salt, so the, the banisters are made out of the stairs, even the chandeliers are made out of salt, and they have all the carvings, and it's basically what the miners used to do in their lunch break, as they were going sort of build this, build this amazing area. Uh, so if you ever get a chance, it's absolutely fantastic. It's one of the most amazing places to visit. So, so that's sort of rock salt, uh, which is basically hundreds of thousands of years old sea salt. So this is sea salt. Uh, this is um, in uh, Bolivia, at Salanda Uni. So this is uh, 19,000 square kilometers of salt. So it's a pretty, pretty huge area. It's an old dried up, dried up sea. Uh, which they actually have a hotel in the middle of it, um, which we sadly weren't able to stay in at the time, but you can now, now stay in it. They hadn't finished the plumbing, which is quite important, I think, probably. For it. But all the, all the beds and everything is made, are made of salt. Uh, and then, uh, you obviously, have, this is a bit more standard. So this is down in Camargue. And actually, what you can see here uh, is the piles here of what they're producing. This is the fleur de sel that they're just scraping off the top. And I was talking to Joanna earlier about the different ways they get fleur de sel. Uh, this is the, probably the easiest method, where they just let everything settle and dry, and then they just take the, the top of it off. And then the third process you have, which is industrial mining, so that's the really fine salt that you get, the stuff you pour on your chips. You know, um, it's very fine, and it's, it, ultimately they pump water underground, uh, they break it, get a salt solution, they pump it up, uh, and then you end up with a, uh, a sort of very... So, I mean, it's the highest concentration you can get. It's 99.9% .9 sodium chloride. It's a very industrial process. And strangely, you end up with round ball bearings. I always find quite strange because salt's obviously a square crystal. So you can prove how much of the process it goes into. Uh, so what inspired us? I mean, I'd sort of seen various places, well, all these places and, and lots more, uh, and the, the, the children would testify to that. But what inspired us? I think there, there are only two places in the world that don't have a natural supply of salt. Uh, one of them is Scandinavia, and the other is Japan. So this is, this is in Japan, actually, where they trickle the seawater down, um, down the bamboo. And you think, Japan, well, that's surrounded by sea. Surely they could, but um, the relative humidity is so high that they're unable to evaporate. So that's why they need to utilise what they have. Uh, and then the other place, um, oh no, sorry, this is another one in, in Japan, a similar process. As you can see, it's almost like a sort of Christmas tree, but these are bamboo that's laid down diagonally. And then the other, other ones that, we came that I came across were actually in Germany and Poland. And this is ultimately what we based our, our design on and what we tried to, I suppose, follow. So uh, these uh, graduation towers, um, sadly, I, I mean, they were I mean, built hundreds of years ago and uh, when they didn't have so much coal. So they had to use other methods of trying to evaporate their, um, their water. And actually, rather than sea salt, they used uh, a, a rock brine. So there was actually just a natural spring that came out of the ground. Um, so they have a, a few of these that they built there. Uh, I think the longest one that they built was 350 metres long. So it's a pretty, Im pretty impressive uh, structure. Sadly, none of them are working anymore. I mean, some of them have still got uh, uh, water going up and down it, but none of them are actually producing salt anymore. That stopped about 60, 70 years ago. Uh, so there's yeah, just another, another picture of it. So having, having sort of looked at that and thought, right, okay, do you know, I, I, I've been uh, trying to, or thinking about making salt for probably a, about 17, 18 years. In fact, I came across a letter that we wrote to um, Chris about, that was about 20, written about 20 years ago. So we've been, we've been thinking about it for a long time and it's taken us quite a bit of time to get here. Uh, and, you know, once we came, once I'd sort of been over there, over to Poland and Germany and said, right, okay, what happens? Well, how, how do we actually do this? No one actually knows the principle behind it. I mean, the principle, the general principle behind it is you want to evaporate water as quickly as possible. And by stretching it out, you can evaporate it. So it's kind of like um, if you do your washing, you know, you, you put, you don't get your washing out of the washing machine and stick it in a ball on top of the wall. You get it and you stretch it out. And it's that basic principle is we're trying to stretch it out as much as possible to evaporate as much as possible naturally. So we did a lot of testing. Um, we worked with Strathclyde University, and uh, you can see their sort of lab up here. We've took some, some blackthorn, 
and we tested the different angles. So not only the angle that the Blackthorn should be at, but the angle of the front of the tower, and also, uh, you know, at what angle should be the best that the wind goes against? Uh, you know, should it be direct 90 degrees, 45 degrees and that? So we spent, I mean, it was a good year's project that we did with them and we ended up with about three figures at the end of it. I mean, they're quite important figures, you know, but they enabled us to design it. But uh, yeah, we, we did lots of tests. You can see in terms of the bundles and where they were. And then this was a little, little model that we built um, to try and work out whether it was going to work. To be honest, the model was not that great, it didn't really work that well, uh, but uh, I think we learned quite a lot about the feeding of the, of the brine and how, how we best do that. So we also worked with Glasgow School of Art, so this is, so my background uh, slightly, well, briefly I joined, I, I was an architect uh, for, for a few years and I studied at the Glasgow School of Art. And, uh, and then I left uh, doing architecture and joined the family business, which was to do with salt, but importing, never actually made salt. So, uh, so I kind of, um, when I was doing this, I thought, oh, you know, that'd be great to go back to the university and go and see my lecturers and say, what about this? And they took it up and they, we, we ended up going off down to Salcoats and pretending that we'd take over the whole of Salcoats and put Blackthorn Towers throughout the whole of it. It was great, it was good fun, but um, yeah, it never, obviously never happened, but it was quite nice to, to think about it. So. So yeah, briefly, so our method, as I sort of touched on before, uh, yeah, we take the we take the seawater in, uh, we take that into these tanks, and then ultimately we're just pumping it up to the top of the tower and to the bottom, and we keep on circulating the brine up and down until we get to the concentration. So seawater, as you, as you know, is about three and a half percent, and we are trying to get it up to about twenty-two percent, and we keep on circulating it round and making sure we, I mean, people quite often ask me, how, how long does it take? Well, do you know, I, I don't have a clue. And, and it's all to do with the weather, you know? And so when the wind is blowing in a certain direction, it will evaporate more. When it's warmer, it will evaporate more. So if you can increase the temperature by 10 degrees on this, we would double the rate of evaporation. So there are so many different effects, that, factors that affect it. Uh, so we keep on circulating it around the tower. Uh, and then after that, we then uh, put it through a filter and then we, we take it into the pan house for the last part. So we evaporate about 90% of the, of, the, of, the, of the brine in the first process. So it's kind of like um, a reverse Ribena. So we ultimately take the, the full pint of, of Ribena and we get down to that concentrate at the end, which is the bit that we go on to afterwards. So the build. Um, that took quite a long time. It was quite tricky. I think um, we obviously trying to find someone who was willing to take this on. It's, you know, it had, one hadn't been built for decades. I tried to speak to someone in Poland to come and help, uh, and they weren't that helpful because, well, they were very helpful, I'm sure, but his Polish, uh, his English was non-existent. My Polish was non-existent. So it was a bit tricky. Uh, so we ended up getting a nice, lovely chat this chap here called Archie McConnell, who basically got along five mates to come and build the tower. And uh, you can see here, this is uh, mostly uh, larch, but the larger bits are Douglas, Douglas fir, the real sort of big, chunky ones here. And once it was put together, it went up quite quickly, as you can see. Uh, they are tied on properly, I promise. Uh, and uh, you can see that we ended up with this Sort of amazing, amazing structure. I, I think you know if you get a chance to come and uh, to come down, we have this sort of odd open day and stuff. Please, please come and have a look at it. Um, and uh, that we then had to start filling it with blackthorn. Now I don't know if any of you have been picking slows. Does anyone pick slows at all? Yeah. yeah. Anyone got any injuries to show for it? That I mean, yeah, it's, it's lethal. Do you know? It's um, it's got those very long spikes on it. But that's, that's what we want, you know, because the long spikes make the surface area greater, which therefore makes the rate of evaporation faster. So, however, when you pick slows, you probably only go to one or two bushes. This is about, we ended up putting in about four hectares worth of blackthorn. So um, we ended up wearing sort of leather lederhosens pretty much to try and not get scratched and scraped throughout the whole of it. Uh, and then, um, 
you can see that's half of it done, then the other half, and actually to trim it off, we just used a, a big hedge trimmer to try and get it. So we wanted to get the angle, as I talked about before, the different angles that we went through the calculations with uh, and all the sort of testing and everything with to try and make sure we got to where we wanted. Um, and then afterwards we have the pan, which we went on to afterwards. So this is, a, I mean, it's a fairly simple pan. It's just got hot water running between uh, a double skin. Uh, and we just vary the temperature depending on the crystals that we're trying to form. And uh, it takes us around about five days for one, for one batch. I can tell you how long that takes. I just can't tell you how long the bit outside takes. Uh, look, that's, that's me harvesting some salt. So, oh. so uh, just a little bit on the design and packaging that we went through. Uh, we did quite a lot with the design. And then this one was the one that was really sent back to us first. But I decided that it looked a little bit like Alcatraz with a hand grenade at the side. <laughs> that that maybe, wasn't, maybe wasn't what we were looking for. Um, and so we obviously got the children in to do a bit of testing as well. Uh, and we ended up with this sort of box and branding at the end. And the flowers around the outside are the blackthorn flowers that you see on, on the thing. I will just say thank you very much. Thank you very much to Joanna for having us along and for all of your team for putting this uh, together and for Scape and everyone for doing that. And if you'd like a sample, come and grab one at the tower. <laughs>